Saturday night short track racing at Martinsville never lets us down, right? Right? <laughs> How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. On the go, we're talking Martinsville. Second day in a row, I'm filming one of these at like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I need to stop making this a habit. This was my first trip to Martinsville. It was a great trip, great atmosphere at the racetrack, even though the weather was kind of a downer. It was freezing cold. It was raining, of course, delaying the race almost an hour. But I had a great time. It was great to meet so many of you guys down at the Speedway this weekend, whether you're there Thursday, Friday, or tonight. I had a fantastic time. Met so many great fans, great people but the race tonight was a total letdown. We're going to talk about that and much, much more. But first, this episode is sponsored by my friends at LubeGuard, makers of the original instant torque converter shutter eliminator, LubeGuard Instant Shutter Fix. Simply add Shutter Fix via your dipstick or fill tube hole, and Shutter Fix will begin working immediately to eliminate torque converter, shutter, chatter, and hard shifting. It's easy to use. It works with all conventional, synthetic, and low-viscosity automatic transmission fluids. LubeGuard Instant Shutter Fix can be purchased through through Advance, AutoZone, CarQuest, Napa, O'Reilly, Pet Boys, or online through Amazon.com. Link is down in the description below. Visit Shutterman.com to find out even more information about the Instant Shutter Fix and other great LubeGuard products. All right, I still have not warmed up completely. That's why I'm still wearing the jacket. Martinsville tonight was delayed again almost an hour due to rain, borderline freezing rain, temperatures in the low 40s. Respect to everyone who came out to the track this year. Stands looked 80, 85% full, looked as good as any Martinsville crowd I've seen in recent years, despite the weather concerns. The weather was a huge factor tonight because tonight's Martinsville race was... Uh, for lack of a better word, a complete letdown. And that's how I want to begin this episode. We will talk about the top finishers. We'll put this thing on the groovy gauge in just a few moments. But I first want to begin with where this race went wrong and what or who is responsible for it. See, for the most part this year, the next gen car has exceeded expectations. We were worried about intermediate tracks and you know, Auto Club, Las Vegas, two of the best races of the season. We were worried about the super speedways, yet the car drafted pretty well at Daytona and even Atlanta. Road courses, this car's bread and butter. Circuit of the Americas was thrilling, had a dramatic all-time great finish. Coming into this season, short tracks were the least of my concerns, yet through the first eight points paying races this year, I think it's safe to say the three short oval races have probably been the three worst races of the season, or at least the, the least thrilling, least exciting, according to most objective fans. And Martinsville tonight was easily the worst race of the season for a wide variety of reasons. And there are a lot of theories going around. I saw drivers like Dale Earnhardt Jr. chiming in on Twitter suggesting that maybe even the shifting, because drivers are actually shifting four times a lap, something I don't know they haven't done at Martinsville in my lifetime. Maybe that was playing some sort of role. The weather, of course, it was cold. This was one of the coldest races in recent Martinsville history, that combined with the tire that Goodyear brought, which is another key factor, prevented any sort of rubber being laid down. Tire wear was was existent, but not, not super significant. Tire wear typically allows for more passing, and when rubber gets put down, the groove winds that allows for multi-groove racing. There were no multiple grooves tonight. It was all right around the bottom, right around the curbs. All of these factors made passing under green extremely difficult, and as a result, led to a less exciting, less eventful race than we're used to seeing, especially at Martinsville. This reminded me of that first Pocono race in 2019 when they had the 550 horsepower high downforce package, but they hadn't added PJ1 to the track yet. There was almost no passing under green that entire race, but we kind of forgot about it because it's Pocono and nobody really expects great side-by-side -side action at Pocono. We expect action at Martinsville. Heck, last night, just over 24 hours ago, we saw one of the most action-packed, albeit a bit sloppy, races of the entire season. We know what Martinsville is capable of. We have a set expectation when we race at the paperclip, and tonight didn't look anything like a Martinsville race. Nobody spun out tonight. I know it was a shorter race instead of 500 laps, it was 400 laps, but no spins, no notable instants all night long. The two cautions for instant were both questionable. This was not Martinsville. This didn't look like any kind of Martinsville I've grown up watching and loving. This was a different race. If this race happens at Pocono, like it did in 2019, we kind of just look past it as another meh Pocono race. But this happened at Martinsville. The half mile of mayhem. I think drivers and fans especially alike can all agree that what we saw tonight, the product, was unacceptable. Richmond last week was maybe not the most thrilling. Phoenix a few weeks back, I know it's a mile long track, had some great restarts at the end and an exciting new winner at the finish, but that race was also kind of lackluster. What is the issue with these shorter flat ovals? 
I expected the next-gen car to race great here. I think everyone did. Composite body would allow the drivers to beat and bang a little bit without fear of cutting a tire down. The shorter distance, of course, meant there should have been an added sense of urgency early in the race, and we didn't see that at all. People weren't even close to putting the bumpers to each other in Stage 1 or Stage 2. All in all, this was a Pocono race at Martinsville. And it sucks because you only race at Martinsville twice a year. We only race at true short tracks, not including Bristol Dirt, five times a year. And the first two this year have been kind of duds. Like, at least Richmond last week had some great strategy at the end. And because it was Richmond and had multiple grooves, there were some passes for position in the top five and top ten. Tonight, one groove that didn't change throughout the night. Very little tire wear. There was almost no passing up front for position. It was a complete dud of a Martinsville race. And that sucks because we only have three more true short tracks to go this season. And short track racing is great. In many ways, that is NASCAR's bread and butter, and it hasn't delivered this year. And I think the next gen car, or at least elements of the next gen car, are partially to blame. More than anything, I think the tire is where they can start with. That's what Joey Logano and actually Austin Dillon talked about after the race. The tire that Goodyear supplies, they've gone with a very conservative compound. As Joey Logano mentioned in his post race, I think they could deviate from that a bit. They could take some risks, bring a tire that wears a bit more, run that risk to hopefully lead to better racing with more passing opportunities and more comers and goers. And more importantly, hopefully later when we come to Martinsville, it'll be hotter. So more rubber will be glued down to the track, but hopefully the groove can widen and there's actually two full lanes. Like think about last time we raced at Martinsville last fall, the final few laps, Hamlin and Bowman. Hamlin was running the outside lane to defend his position. Tonight, nobody ran the outside lane. Nobody deviated from the curb. If you did, it's because you made a mistake, and that's why there was no passing tonight. Heck, even the bump and run seemed broken. Like, on the final restart, that final overtime restart, I was sitting right there in the center of turns one and two. Joey Logano on the white flag lap gave Byron a couple pretty huge shots, and Byron barely budged. He budged like two feet off the, the bottom line. No chance for Logano to make a move. This track just seemed broke. This felt like no Martinsville race I've ever seen. I'm going to keep calling it the Pocono of Martinsville races. And anytime I'm comparing your, your race to Pocono, that's usually not a good thing. Sorry, Pocono fans, but especially in the case of Martinsville. Martinsville is the antithesis of Pocono. It's everything Pocono isn't. Yet tonight's race felt, again, like that 2019 spring Pocono date before they added PJ1. Don't add PJ1 to Martinsville. Don't add resin to Martinsville. Come on, no, no, let's not do that. Let's not get crazy. Bring a better tire. Hopefully the weather is conducive to better racing in the future. I don't know. NASCAR certainly has to go back to the drawing board because the next gen has thrived everywhere this year, but the short ovals. And I do think there's potentially something about the car that could be tweaked, starting likely with the tires. I'm no engineer. I'm no expert. I'm just theorizing. Tonight's racing was unacceptable by Martinsville standards. That's all we know. Let's fix it. Let's find a way. Smarter people out there can find a way to fix it, I hope. Anyway, let's actually talk about the race. This thing was dominated by two drivers. Chase Elliott led the first like 100 and 80, 200 laps or so. William Byron took the lead after stage two, thanks to his pit crew getting him out ahead of Chase Elliott. And I don't think he ever relinquished the lead again. Long green flag runs. It came down to an overtime restart after NASCAR threw that quick caution for what, like Todd Gilliland, I don't know, breathing a little heavy or something. Byron was still able to hold off Logano. Austin Dillon stood out tonight. We've talked a lot about Austin Dillon's teammate, Tyler Reddick, this year, who's run up front and been close to wins. But Austin Dillon was a shining star night. Started mid-pack in the 20s, I believe consistently, slowly but surely, did work his way forward. Pitch strategy, good fast pit stops, some good restarts. He got up near the front and had a shot at the lead late. I mentioned Joey Logano, his teammate Ryan Blaney was a threat up inside the top five as well. Kurt Busch snuck in there late. It was again a hit or miss night for Toyota. Joe Gibbs Racing was garbage. Denny Hamlin won a lap down in stage one. Martin Truex Jr. was mired mid-pack all night long. And at Martinsville, the track that's practically named after Martin Truex Jr., a mid-pack run like that is also unacceptable. Kyle Busch never got the handle right. He snuck in towards the top 10 late, but he ran in the mid-teens all day. Christopher Bell, surprisingly, was their one bright spot. He ran up in the top five until a penalty on pit road cost him that track position. Bubba Wallace had a pit road penalty and, and was mired mid-pack for most of the race. He rebounded for a top 15, I believe, but Kurt Busch up front was the only mild bright spot for Toyota, which is a bit surprising and concerning. We were talking last week at Richmond about maybe Toyota and Joe Gibbs Racing being back to an extent well, they did take a step backwards here at Martinsville, so that's worth noting. Anyway, let's look at some of the top finishers. Bubba actually finished 16th, I apologize. Ross Chastain did sneak into the top five there towards the end. He was one driver who did seem to move through the field, but that's the thing. It was so hard to pass out there that Chastain started this race 27th. He never really went backwards at any point in this race. He was consistently picking them off one at a time, whether on pit road or maybe somehow possibly on the racetrack, likely in traffic. And the best he could get to was fifth. And he was helped a little bit by that last restart, gained him another couple of spots. The 
choose rule. Honestly, the choose rule was the best way to make up positions tonight. There's Kurt and Kyle Busch, like I mentioned. SHR was pretty fast. Actually, everyone not named Kevin Harvick looked pretty good out of SHR. You see a couple of them in the top 10 right there. Cole Custer ran in the top five throughout the first half of this race until I believe he also had a pit road penalty at the end of stage two. I mentioned that this race was dominated by a couple of Hendrick guys. William Byron, we'll talk about in a moment, got the win, obviously. Chase Elliott led a lot of laps, but faded, partially just because he faded. Like he actually fell back to fourth or fifth on his own. And then pit strategy before that final caution came out didn't seem to go his way. They must have been slow on pit road or something because he lost a few more spots. They chose to pit, lost even more track position. They got some of it back, obviously. But 10th place for a guy who dominated the first portion of this race, a little disappointing. Alex Bowman, Kyle Larson were kind of no-shows compared to their other Hendrick teammates. That best, they were running 8th, ninth, or 10th. Kyle Larson had a speeding penalty in stage 3, which is why he finished 19th. And I mean, there aren't really a whole lot of other major storylines uh, to speak of. Let's talk about William Byron for a second. He he is the first two-time winner of the 2022 season, so that's a pretty big deal. Also won a stage, so six playoff points tonight, a ton of stage points as well going towards his regular season championship bid. A great night for William Byron. He was my pick coming into this weekend. He just looked smooth at Richmond last week. He's always been a good short track racer. He just doesn't always get the job done. But this year, through these first few weeks, we're starting to see William Byron actually seal the deal, close out some of these races. He and Rudy Fugler are a great team, and I think we're starting to see the best of it right now. I think William Byron's a legit championship th threat this year. He's made the playoffs the last couple of years. He's made it out of the first round, but usually he doesn't go much further than that. I think this is the year William Byron could go out and win a championship without question. And this is his, what, fourth, fifth? Is this his fourth, fifth? This is his fifth full-time year in Cup now, isn't it? 2018, 19, 20, 20. Fifth! Oh my gosh, I feel old now. Fifth year in Cup. At this point, if you're as talented as we all thought you were dominating truck and Xfinity races years ago, now's your time to shine. Now's where you got to put up a crooked number in the win category. William Byron has already succeeded in doing that. So uh, 24 cars here to stay. He's the threat this year to win without question. He just sneaks up on us because he's not a big personality at all. We're used to all these big personalities stealing the show like last night in the Xfinity race. Byron is not that. Byron is head down, get the job done. He's won with his crew chief in the past in trucks. He's winning with him again today. That's a dangerous combination. I'm really excited to see that panning out. When they first announced that Fugel was leaving KBM for Hendrick a couple of years ago, I was excited. That relationship is really starting to flourish. So good on William Byron. Happy to see him get the win. He earned it. This race was a drag. This race was not entertaining by any means, but at least the most deserving driver and team won the race. At least we can hang our hat on that one. Let's put this thing on the groovy gauge. That's right. It followed me out here to Martinsville. Again, in person, it was still fun. Any race you go see in person, you're going to come away with an added layer of respect because you can see with your own naked eyes all the little tight battles here and there that TV's not able to catch. But even with that bias in mind, this is going to be one of the lowest scores I've ever given a race, I think, on the Groovy Gauge. I'm a pretty positive person. Any NASCAR race is at least somewhat enjoyable in my eyes. But Martinsville Speedway has very high expectations behind it. And tonight's race not only fell flat, just as a NASCAR race in general, it fell extremely flat by Martinsville's standards. So I can't give this race any higher than a 25% on the groovy gauge. That might be the lowest score. Longtime viewers, you might have to go back, dig back. There's probably a worst race out there. Maybe I've changed my formatting again. This is a very experimental and unscientific scoring system here. But I don't know. This race just left no positive impression on me at all. Like I can't find one, like just a clear redeemable quality about this race. Like not one thing. Passing wasn't prevalent. It was one groove. The weather sucked. And <laughs> I know that's not the race's fault, but the weather was bad if you were there. Like uh, honestly, nope, there is one redeemable quality. It was short. The race from green to checkered was a little under three hours in length, and thank heavens. I don't think I could have survived another 100 laps. I'm thrilled that they dropped the spring race to 400 miles, gives the spring and the fall race different identities, and I still am a believer now. If NASCAR wants to retain its audience or reach newer, especially younger audiences, they're going to have to change with the times, and I don't think any race outside of you know a couple of the crown jewels should be more than 400 miles or certainly should be no more than three hours long. The more races we can get into that two to two and a half hour range, honestly, I think it's for the better. I know a lot of you guys disagree with me, but I'm going to die on that hill until data proves otherwise. That's the one redeemable quality of this race is that I think it clocked in at like 245, 250. That was a good thing. I can say that, but not much else. A total letdown by Martinsville standards, unfortunately. 25%. This is the first race this year that I felt like was just a flop. Even Richmond, Phoenix, Atlanta, depending on how you feel about it, even those races had very positive redeeming qualities about them. This race 
really didn't have any. I was just left scratching my head throughout most of this thing. Like, how did this happen to, to Martinsville? Like I said, we didn't expect the next-gen car to struggle at Martinsville. This was the kind of track we expected it to thrive at. Tight corners, beating and banging. This is what the next-gen was built for, right? So what happened? I hope the smart folks at NASCAR and, and all the race teams, I hope they come up with some ideas and, and something that can fix this place before the fall race, of course, or before the next short track race. I don't even know when the next short track race is. Not counting Bristol Dirt next week, is it Bristol Summer Race? So we got time. We got time. Hopefully changes are made for the better. Anyway, share your thoughts down below. What are your feelings or impressions from this race here tonight, the Blue Emu 400? I had a great time all weekend long. The race was a bit of a letdown for sure, but it was, like I said, great to see so many of you at the track. I was shocked by the amount of out-of-the-groove viewers, groovy gang members that were here in the hills of Virginia. That was really, really cool. It's great to see so many of you in person, shake your hands, talk racing with you, share my predictions, share our thoughts together. That was a really fun time. Too bad the actual race was a letdown. Anyway, share your thoughts down in the comment section below. That's going to do it. As always, a big thank you to my amazing Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this show or travel to these races like this without your incredible support. I hope you guys are continuing to enjoy the content. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future uploads. We'll be back in the studio this week. I won't be at Bristol Dirt, so we'll be back in our with our normally scheduled programming here before too, too long. Thanks for sticking with me, all Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again later this week.